much. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning to talk to you a little bit about the science of Mars in general and Mars Express, which has been in orbit for over eight years at Mars. And, and of course, we're very proud and very pleased to be able to support what is an extremely exciting event for scientists around the world. Uh, Curiosity is an astonishing rover, and I think we'll do some amazing science uh, for everybody. So let me give you a little bit of uh, context here. We in ESA operate a number of uh, space science missions, both for astrophysics, looking out, if you like, out of the solar system, and also a number of missions within the solar system looking at the sun and the various planets. Now, one of the most compelling questions, both scientifically and philosophically, is are we alone? Are we the only life in this universe, or did life manage to develop elsewhere? Now, in the last 20 years or so, we've discovered that elsewhere in the universe, there are hundreds of planets orbiting other stars. We know that. that they exist, gas giant planets, and even down to terrestrial planets like the Earth. So we know that those planets exist, but they're hard to get to. They're a long way away. So, of course, if you want to start looking for signs of life elsewhere, you may well come to your own solar system. Now, Earth's twin is Venus. Venus is the nearest planet. It's roughly the same size as the Earth. It has the same surface gravity. Why don't we just go there? Well, Venus is deeply inhospitable. That's the problem. It has an atmospheric pressure roughly 100 times that of Earth and a, tempera a temperature up to 460 degrees centigrade at the surface, so it will mel melt lead and zinc. Um, the Russians, of course, our, our colleagues uh, in, the Soviet in the former Soviet Union days landed several very pioneering rovers on the surface, and these images are still astonishing to this day, many years later. Uh, but Venus is not a place that we really uh, feel that we should go be looking for life. Well, where else in the solar system? We know that surrounding uh, the gas giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, there are a number of moons which have oceans deep below their icy surfaces. Uh, Ganymede is one such moon, uh, Europa, uh, also at Jupiter, and uh, Enceladus at Saturn. Now, we can go there, but of course, digging deep down below that ice will take a long time. Nevertheless, we're exploring these systems, and in ESA, we've now recently selected to send uh, a mission called JUICE, which will go uh, to the icy moons of Jupiter and arrive somewhere around 2030. So I hope many of you will still be with us at that point and uh, look for very exciting results there. So. That's where we might want to look. Another sort of outlier in all of this is Titan. Titan has a very thick atmosphere, roughly the same as the Earth's uh, the pressure, but a very different kind of chemistry, uh, a hydrocarbon cycle uh, with ethane and methane lakes, liquid uh, hydrocarbon, which evaporates from the surface, rains back into rivers and lakes. So a very exciting place. And of course, we landed there with the Cassini-Huygens missions, which Thomas mentioned already. And that's the furthest landing ever made in the solar system by any mission. Uh, from any country, and I think that's an astonishing achievement still today by ESA. So, if not those planets, then where? Well, Mars. Mars has held fascination for an awful long time, and what's the fundamental reason for that? One of the key reasons is that we have very strong evidence that Mars had a huge amount of water on its surface in the past, and has water today. Now, of course, many of you are familiar with the idea at the late end of the 1800s there were actually canals on Mars, excavated perhaps by Martians. And we now know that this is these, these uh, straight lines are an artifact of the way that people look through telescopes from the Earth. Uh, the more modern view of, the, uh, of Mars today, uh, technology is failing us here. I'll try one more time. There we go is a view from the Hubble Space Telescope taken uh, 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 just less than 10 years ago. And so that's the contemporary view, and it shows Mars as a very dusty, brown, dry world. And of course, Mars is not really like the Earth. It's half the size of the Earth in, in, in radius. Um, it has a, a lower gravity than the Earth, only 40% or so, and it has a very thin atmosphere, only half a percent of the atmospheric density of Earth. And that varies by an awful lot, by a factor of two. And that's one of the core reasons, uh, one of the key problems that Curiosity has to face this morning is how it gets down onto the surface through a very thin atmosphere when we don't know what that density will actually be at the moment where it enters the atmosphere. So again, it's problems that we've uh, experienced with several missions there. Um, this is a fascinating picture to me because this is actually one of our other missions which went past Mars a few years ago, Rosetta, en route to its rendezvous with Comet, um, which I hope you'll come back for next year. Um, and it shows not only Mars in this view but also moon Phobos and its shadow on the surface of Mars, and two interesting locations, Gusev Crater where uh, NASA's Spirit uh, rover has been and, and 
This was operating for six years, and this morning's landing site, Gale Crater. So this is where Curiosity will be landing this morning. So Mars has been the subject of an enormous number of missions over the years, and I by no means want to go through those, but I want to draw the line between the surface rovers, which Curiosity hopefully will be the, the, the latest representative of, and all of the orbiting ro uh, missions. Because, of course, if you can go to the surface, it's almost like being there. You can go and explore and start scratching the surface and start working out what's there. And that's what Curiosity's goal is today. But, of course, it can only go to a very small range of locations. Even though it's a rover, it's only going to see a few kilometers. Um, and so orbiters are very important to get a much more global view. So this is ESA's Mars Express in integration at Baikonur in 2003. And I'm not going to go through the details. Anybody you can ask me later on, there are a whole range of scientific instruments including images and spectrometers and radar instrumentation. And I want to show you a few s results from that just to set the scene for today. So this is Mars Express in orbit. This is the launch, which occurred in 2003. This is a picture of Phobos. Phobos is one of Mars's two moons. These are not like Earth's moon. They're much smaller, probably captured asteroids. But we don't know that. And in fact, Mars Express has made a lot of uh, interesting insights into the uh, the possible origins of this rather enigmatic moon seen here against the background of Mars. And we've flown very close by with the help here from the, of our colleagues here at ESOC to less than 100 kilometers flying by uh, Phobos. And that takes an awful lot of work and precision to manage uh, flying past a moving object in orbit around another rather big object. So let me go to a couple of key scientific results, and I can only really touch on this. One of the really main results of Mars Express was the detection of methane in Mars's atmosphere. Methane is a gas that shouldn't really be there unless there's some bizarre kind of potentially biological activity or geological activity below the surface. This chart shows the original discovery data. What we also know is that methane is very variable, changes rapidly, uh, now, that shouldn't happen. Methane lives for hundreds of years in the atmosphere of a planet like Mars once it's formed. So methane is being destroyed rapidly and replenished rapidly and coming out of certain locations. And a, a, key, cre a key interesting question for Europe and for science is to find out where that methane comes from and whether that potentially has a biogenic origin. So that would be fascinating, methane emanating from the subsurface. This has been confirmed from the Earth. It was controversial at the time, but we now know there, there to be methane in the atmosphere of Mars. Mars has a very complex surface, so we're going to go and look at a couple of images now. And one of the most fundamental aspects of Mars is that the southern hemisphere is very high and rocky and has lots of craters, and the northern hemisphere is low and smooth. And that tells us that the northern hemisphere must have been reprocessed. This is the original ter uh, terrain on Mars. This is pr uh, terrain on Mars that has been somehow resurfaced because there would have been craters here as well. But where are they now? They've gone. So we've been imaging the surface with the camera on Mars, the HRSC, for many years. We've covered a great deal of the surface. And we see lots of regions like this, chaotic terrain, where one might think, well, these are river valleys. But in fact, they may also be tectonic uh, ripples in the surface of Mars. We see craters. So although this indicates the possibility of there being water in the past of Mars, you can't actually say from images like this. However, we do know that there's water on Mars in the form of ice. The North Pole and the South Pole in the summer, when the carbon dioxide has sublimated, leaves water ice. And we know there's water ice in the poles. And we know that in some of the craters, there's still water ice. So we know that's there. But we also have ev evidence of water in the deep distant past. This is a fascinating image of a river delta, an alluvial fan, where in the deep past of Mars, three to four billion years ago, water flowed out in a river valley out into an alluvial uh, plain here. Now, this stands above the surface of Mars today. It's larger rocks which have stood up as a mesa, and the surrounding terrain has been eroded. But this is a direct indication of rivers on Mars in the past. We also know that there are glaciers just below the surface of Mars. Uh, the round structures here around these uh, eroded mountains here actually are evidence of glaciers, ice glaciers, just 20 meters below the surface. And we know with our radar imaging that there's ice in the North Pole. This is a transect across the North Pole seen in an image here. And we can actually trace ice down to a few kilometers. And more than that, we can actually trace subsurface ice across the whole surface. So at the equator, Mars Express, with its Mars instrument, has traced through radio echo, uh, radio echo, radar echoes, has probed uh, the subsurface down to a few tens of meters, and has found that there's about a million cubic kilometers of water ice. Now, that sounds like a lot, but it's actually only about a quarter of the volume of the Mediterranean. 
So it's not a huge amount of water compared to the Earth, but that's at the equator. How did it get there? Why is there so much ice at the equator rather than the poles? And one thing we do know about Mars is its polar axis tilts chaotically and, and, uh, and by a lot. So what is the equator today on Mars was formerly the poles. So you're actually getting a di very large swing in the temperature range and the, uh, the conditions on Mars over billions of years. We also know at the poles, from recent results, that the South Pole shows a little bit of water ice, but the North Pole, what's shown in blue here, shows a huge amount of water ice just below the surface. And this is or, or evidence for water in the past. And what we believe this was an ocean which formed maybe three billion years ago when Mars's axis was tilted and a lot of ice melted and flooded out and formed an ocean. So in the end, this is what our picture of Mars might have been like a few billion years ago. This is not a pure simulation. It's using contemporary images filled in with water to a certain level. So Mars with a northern ocean. Now, what's, what are we doing today? Why are we going back there if we know there's water? Well, we want to dig below the surface and look at mi mi uh, minerals which formed in the presence of water. So this is an image, and you can see all of this splashed material around the outside, excavated by the impact. And Mars Express over the years has shown that this material, which has been splashed out from this under the surface, contains an awful lot of what are called hyd hydrated silicates, minerals which must have formed in the presence of water. We know that from Earth's geology, and we know that must have operated on Mars. So there was a huge amount of water under the surface, up to depths of kilometers, which formed minerals which we can trace today. And so that, why are we going to Gale Crater today? Why is NASA landing its large Curiosity rover in this landing ellipse in the top corner here? Well, because Gale has got a lot of evidence for water in the past and hydrated minerals which it wants to investigate. This shows the context. There's the landing ellipse again. There's an alluvial fan like the one at Eberswalde, which I showed you earlier on. So already evidence for rivers having flowed into this crater. And then within driving distance, of that location, they'll be able to find minerals which include, and this is uh, a close-up image, includes the phyllosilicates, clays, which formed in the presence of water, sulfates, uh, which formed in the presence of water, all in this uh, very unique location, Gale Crater. So there's a lot of science to be done in this treasure chest. In a few minutes' time, hopefully, that mission will begin. And so we're, we're awaiting this uh, seven minutes of terror now and uh, I should all press our thumbs for uh, curiosity this morning. It's going to be a great thing. So thank you very much. <laughs>